Welcome to Nostalgia Alley. I'm your host. We have an exciting show. We have Carmine Siccarello. Hope I got that right. And this is a man who is a crusader. This is a man who's one man's fight to save the famous Paramount Theater in Newark. Now, why should we save the Paramount Theater and tell us a little bit about it? Well, Mike, first of all, let me thank you for asking me aboard your Nostalgia Channel. I want to wish everyone a very healthy and happy new year. Um, I'm a Norker by background, but one of the famous Norkers, King of Comedy, Jerry Lewis, was usher at the Paramount. I have a beautiful photo because I love Lou Costello and Bud Abbott. Ah, oh, the best. Oh, Lou out of Patterson, mm -hmm. and then Bud out of Asbury Park. Asbury Park. Yes, and and of course when they they, they they came to Newark, I don't have the exact date. I think it's the 1940s with their manager, and they're in the projection room of the Paramount, uh, with Mr. A. A. Adams. Now, why Mr. A. A. Adams is so important is because he was hounded out of Patterson, New Jersey. Why? Because they didn't pay the rent. To well, the that's city. a good reason. Yes, and, and Mr. Adams, in his young age, begged the city of Patterson police and the, uh, the mayor and all of please, I'll pay you, I'll pay you, but please give me time to get my local Nickelodeon established. They wouldn't. Came to Newark. He was very fortunate, 1920s. He got actually $300,000 out of John Dryden's Prudential. A lot of money back then. Yeah, a lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money uh, to get into what is called the Newark Theater. It was started as Miners in 1886 by a guy, Henry Miner from New York, right? On that, uh, well, it's Market Street, and then you have Broad Street, really near the corner there. I'll call that East Market, right? Uh, next to it was the Great Newark Evening News. It was a very busy block because later on you'd see the celebration of VE Day victory over Europe, and also outside, uh, victory over Japan, VJ Day. A very historic theater. What burns me to a crisp, maybe that's one where my devils, I love, I have a love of these devils, right. uh, burns me to a crisp, is that they want to leave only the marquee. Really? Oh yeah, I want the whole thing preserved. Now, It's in bad condition though, I know well, that. Well yes, thank God, can I t take, tell about the book? This we have to thank Mr. Philip M. Reed, R-E-A-D, made a magnificent book under the uh, heritage of New Jersey. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the heritage. Arcadia does a history of the United States, right? And these are books about each state's uh, very known places. And this one but was... The Paramount was one of the most famous of the Newark theaters, I know. Yes. Uh, very elegant. Uh, Jerry would have had to wear a tux at one time for the Friday night, Saturday night. Uh, specials, you know, and all that. Uh, but we had at least 40 neighborhood theaters. We were that, that 40 big, neighborhood, neighborhood theaters, theaters in Newark, New Jersey. Despite the fact that I can't give you the name of all the 15 downtown theaters. 15. Now, how many of these magnificent theaters exist today? Only a few that I'm aware of, okay, because I've scouted around. Even with my bad back, I've Mike looked around and looked up alleys and stuff. Right now, we have the... Only the Paramount has its great marquee saying Newark on it, on the front, chase lights and all. But otherwise, on Brantford Place, if you'd go to the corner of where Broad and Market intersect, the main intersection, go uh, north and you go to Brantford Place, opposite Old First. Old First Church is on that side, and here's Brantford Place. The Brantford Theater itself was torn down. Mr. Adams owned all the major properties downtown, at least the four majors that I'll, I'll speak about. Um, but then you go to the Adams Theater, which he named for himself. It was an opera house. Started before his time. He took What that year over. was the Adams Theater opened? Okay, well, that's beyond me right now. Okay. i got to say that I'm going to guess early 1900s. It was a, like an opera house. And then the movies came. And, of course, mm. the big thing, we got to go 1927, the silence became talkies. Right. So the theater is even more popular than ever. 
Uh, but A. A. Adam, A. A. Adams, he put his name on it. Adams, I was there to see Ben Hur in 1959. What a wonderful occurrence because in 1959, they had a flag coming out over the marquee in red and gold saying uh, the motion picture that I saw was El Cid, right? I remember that. You know, and inside the theater were hawkers, Mike, selling programs for only a dollar each. But then if you go over to the other uh, side a little bit, go leave your Brantford place and go that direction, which would be south, right? Mm -hmm. Walk a little south, come to the famous Market Street, and if you look to your right, you'll see the old Bamberger's building. Yes, and, I know that well. And now it's made... Big well, department store. Yes, Mike, remember, it lasted to Macy's for a few years. I was there when there were nine floors of Renaissance Christmas. Newark was a bustling downtown Yes, area. I remember. Uh, exciting. The theaters, the restaurants, uh, the jazz clubs and all that. Uh, there are some great writers out there. I hope I'll remember on, on a program of yours someday the great writer that writes about the jazz and the clubs and all that. She's a lady who's done wonders right, mm -hmm. on that. But getting back to if you go there to the Market Street, you'll actually, if you look down the block, and there's the big Macy's building. You can't miss that. We used to be Louis Bamberger. Across the way, you won't see the signage. The marquee is off, but that was the RKO Proctor's. Tell me about, was that a big theater, the Proctor Theater? I love that theater because I came out of there thinking I was James Bond. Wow. When I was 18 years of age, Mike, what happens is I'm actually seeing Bond, but the first thing is a Dave Clark 5. It's like a oh, like rock now videos. Oh, we're going way back. Yeah, it says glad all over on that, and it was wonderful because a large screen, right, and all that. But then came Bond, Shirley Bassey's beam, boom, booming voice of Goldfinger, and I came out of that strutting to the Newark City subway thinking I was James Bond at 18. Well, we all did at 18. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But what a fine theater. And I'll tell you, there's something special about the Archeo Proctors. They had a second theater on top. A second theater on yes, top? Yes, a second theater on top, not known to any other theaters in Newark. The second theater was so good that Essex County College used it for their graduations until they built their campus, you know, further up Essex Heights, up, up Market Street, right? Is that theater still in, in good condition if you were to go you inside? No, sadly, it, uh, the uh, great book left here or? shows us, and I gave you a copy of it, sadly. Right. I could get another copy, but I gave you the photocopies. It's sadly, all of them are in Dowager State. All of them would need at least a million dollars of reconstruction. The carpets, uh, the actual theater proscenium stage itself, great damage because over the years, the, roof, the roofs or roofs of these buildings were never reappointed. But Prudential should do something about it, just in the memory alone of what their corporate did for Mr. Adams, right, helping things out, just to have even one theater left, the Paramount. They should have something left. I mean, these magnificent theaters have to be saved. I Woolitzer mean. Organ, Mike. I mean, the world, you, sir. Woolitzer. Yes. You came in there. I mean, today you go to the Devils, because I was actually a teacher, librarian at Eastside, but at night I'd come and help out because I wanted to push my son to the back door. Mm. <laughs> Maybe Lamorello would take Cigarello. It never happened, but nonetheless I was there as usher until I got my back illness. But let me just say here that uh, the theater is so special that if we destroy this, we destroy the feeling of the industrial age. We go back in Newark, there's only a few houses of the colonial age left, only a couple. The 1800 houses, many of them just torn away, okay? So this is a great thing for young people especially. Go in, become part of a crew, a gaffer, a lighter, right, for instance. Uh, become behind the scenes, whatever you like to do, camera, right, and, and things. And then le let's put that stage back. But again, it requires noblesse oblige, the noble obligation of Prudential Public Service, Panasonic, who else is down there, Blue Cross Blue Shield, many others, to really get their shoulder behind the wheel and say, if this house goes down, and we know it's in deplorable shape. Philip Reed, I don't know how he got in there, but he shows us the inside of the extant houses. They're all in deplorable in shape. Bad. Yes. Because most are made of plaster, and when the yeah. roof leaks, the plaster crumbles. Yeah, but look at the beautiful rugs, shame. Mike. Look at the beautiful rugs that were there. It was a place to escape, especially the Great Depression.
people actually went more to see the movie Palaces in the movie because it was like going to Versailles. You had yes. these magnificent yes. theaters. Yes. And during the Depression, where you lived from hand to foot, you could really relive the magnificence of yesteryear. The Dumont yep. TVs were a real piece of furniture. Oh, yes. I mean, it was elegant. Yes. Most yes. of the TVs yes. weren't as elegant as the du with carving, and it was it was like the old theaters. The cabinet yes. of a Dumont yes. TV was you know, like an old theater. You know, my father's set, uh, but this one was, I, we had a Dumont that was in the sunroom. We had an admiral from Chicago, uh, because that Dumont was brought over by my grandmother. The admiral, we waited till 53 when I was seven years old, but it was a blessing. You know why? why I heard things on radio. Ah, the so I had to Theater of Imagination my, oh, radio. Oh, yes. But when I was seven years old, Dad finally broke down with Mom. Both were school, Newark school teachers. They bought an Admiral. You know what the Admiral had? No. The Admiral had not only the TV on top, but radio and phonograph. Oh, wow. A whole so I would play center. the old records and, <laughs> and call out these songs, and they say, oh, that scorched cat. That's on 492 Highland Avenue, but again, I loved singing to the records. My aunt had a restaurant. We used to get all the records from the Seaberg machines into, you know, uh, the house, thanks to my sister. Now, I know that there was a broadcasting station at the old Bamberger's department store, right? There yes, W-O-R. Started there. W-O-R saved one of the great blimps out at sea. How did they That's do that? A, because they were able to communicate. They were able to communicate with the blimp that was in trouble and got it out of trouble. Louis Bamberger wisely, like Wanamaker, Philadelphia, and many wise, uh, Sebastian Kresge, who eventually had a Kresge's at our, our place uh, from Ohio, they decided to use radio stations to sell their product. Mm. I was a radio man behind the wall of two guys, department stores. Ladies, get your coats and suits, 50% ah. off. <laughs> we hid in a little area behind the, um, the floor, and uh, my boss... A wonderful co-worker was Art Fleming. I remember that distinctly, this Afro-American Was a broadcaster, Art, Art Fleming, a broadcaster? Or? Well, this man was, was, was Afro-American that I met. He said, oh, I don't buy any new clothes. I wear them and just throw them away. Well, of course, we did work at, at, at S. Klein's, you know. Uh, but it was so interesting to see him. Uh, anyway, we got to take a break. And we're, we're going to, the second half is going to be devoted to something very interesting. All of the old cemeteries in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, you have a wonderful story about a very special statue yes, Mike. that stands, yes, Mike. Yes, Mike. and I want to hear all about it. Thank you, Mike. So we're going to come right back after this public service announcement. Don't touch that dot. We meet online, and I tell you, I'm falling in love. I have to see you in person, but I need a loan for the ticket. I really think you're the one. And I really think you're desperate. Sure enough, you send cash and never see me again. Too smart to fall for this? Last year alone, 12 million Americans lost money this way. Can you believe it? You shouldn't. I made that up too. Might not be as smart as you thought you were. Welcome back. We have a super guest, the unofficial mayor of Newark, New Jersey, Carmine Siccarello. Uh, you, I think you know more about Newark than anybody. You're a walking encyclopedia. It's amazing. We're very fortunate. We have a dozen very, very, even with PhDs that are historian. But I always wanted uh, the mayor to anoint me after the passing of Dr. Clement Price. After the passing, uh, Sharp James had put on another gentleman, uh, that was Charles Cummings. I wanted to be a Newark historian, at least for a brief time. Well, you are, actually. Uh, uh, you well, unofficial, of... unofficial, because you know why, Mike, I'm going to tell you, there are 10 of 12 gifted peoples that are out there that are excellent. I'd like him to put one for each ethnicity, Afro-American uh, Afro person, uh, Asian-American uh, Latino American have many historians, not just one. It would be great. I, I don't want a fee. I want us just to be able to get into the schools and bring this up, right? So the young people know the color of it all. I'm making you the official historian of Nostalgia Alley. Oh, <laughs> you're great. You're great. You're now, I, I want to get to cemeteries. Before I do that, yes. though, let me say one thing. Hello to James Mantle. A shout out. You're very fortunate here at this great high school. I think it's called Columbia Maplewood. Mm -hmm. You have them now. 
He is, in my estimation, and he made film on the cemetery under a title called Stone Voices. James, Mr. James Mano, not only is he gifted in music, but he's a very gifted film. All right, maker. now let's let's talk about the Please. cemeteries. Yes. There's yes. A, a special statue in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Newark that has a wonderful history, and I know you did an article on it. Tell us about the lady who stands on the pedestal. Mike, what happened is the following. Uh, my family had never allowed me to go down to the old Italian ghetto, the old Italian, Irish, many ethnicities. Today it's a barrio ghetto. Uh, a lot of Latino uh, peoples there. Uh, it's a sad area because we used to have down there the normal school, which is now Kane University. They right. left us. Another one I'm angry at left us in the 70s. Uh, that was the pharmacy school of Rutgers. But they let's get away. let's get Let me, to the statue. Okay. We've the got to get to the statue there among all Broadway. Okay. Okay. In an 1840s built cemetery. Now it was uh, built because downtown they were building too much. And they had to hurt the older cemeteries. It used to be one even near, well, as we know, near Broader Market. Mm. So they built this Victorian cemetery. And uh, uh, I found about it only when I was older, living at Belleville. I came down on a bicycle because my family would allow me to go from, the, the, let's say, the upper portion of the North Ward. We had a shopping district on Mont Prospect Avenue. Right. So I never got down to that, that part there. But tell us about Maud, the Lady Maud statue. Well, I have to hear about that. What happens is that... Coming by bicycle, I'm visiting the whole cemetery, but all of a sudden I come upon a statue that's looking at me. And I thought the statue, you know, sometimes you think you hear something, right, mm -hmm. in the wind or whatever. So tell my story. It's a little girl. She's 10 and 3 quarters years of age, okay? She would have been like Isadora Duncan. Brilliant, brilliant. And here's a tie-in. She danced at the Paramount. Really? When it was called Miner's Theater. The Paramount was up in 1886. In 1891, a professor Salagdio from the dance school held a recital there, and um, Mistress Maud Harrison Munn, she was a Harrison, like the Benjamin Harrison of note on her mother's side, the president, and uh, Master Mortimer danced solo. That was her brother, Mortimer Munn, who lives for a long time. But there was that statue that's beautiful. It's on a pedestal. And uh, the statue sadly is dying away because the father, he brought a, a, a piece of sculpture. Some, like Bill Gordon, who made the magnificent article, the late, great Bill Gordon, Newark Evening News and the Star Ledger. It was a feature story in the Star Ledger in 1986. Here I am going to the radio station to turn on the radio and be Mike Morris of WRN 1510. Who do I see? Me and Maud on the front page of the Star Ledger. Uh, what a gift it was that the editor decided to put it late December. But what makes um, her special? What is a special thing that really brought you to her? I think the special thing is the Maud H. Lynch, Munn? Uh, yeah, Maud Harrison Munn, M A U D. Right. Uh, what made her special? Because she died on New Year's Day. New Year's Day? Oh, yeah, January 1st, 1892. And on the back of it, uh, which is a base, okay, uh, there is a beautiful poem to her for her about it before, she's before the throne of God. Uh, but I'd also want you to know that she is actually sitting on a broken tree stump or trunk. The Victorian symbol for that was life cut off. Mm. So she's sitting on that, beautifully done. But over the years, you know, it's all the uh, rain, uh, the ice, right, the snow. Because in 1905, her wonderful father, Albert Cortland Munn, who was an actor himself, his main job, though, was in New York as a, uh, a middle, medium banker. They never went to the Ballantine House because they weren't rich enough. They were back on Burnett Street in a townhouse where the Ballantines, you know, Ballantine Mansion, Newark Museum and all that. Uh, she never saw Alice in her beautiful doll houses. But to get back to Maud, uh, the father was and mother were crucified when Maud came down with scarlet fever. In the month of December, she had danced, remember, it at Miner's Theater, which is now the Paramount, right, uh, in 1891, June. But in December, she is dying of scarlet fever. Uh, the St. Michael's Hospital was there on what used to be called High Street. Now it's called Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard. But no one went there who had some money because they didn't have sulfur drugs. 
So they kept him at home, and Albert Cortland Munn and his wife kept the doctor with her and uh, put her in ice in the bathtub and, mm, and all wow. that stuff. But she does pass. Uh, her little heart stops beating on the morning of January 1st, 1892. And the most glorious thing is years later, the Beach Boys made a song. It's just incredible. What was the song? Surf's Up. How did that connect to her? Because it describes everything. I mean, this her is her album, Surf's Up. A blind class aristocracy back from the in the opera glass you see, the pit and the pendulum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the song, if I had the lyrics with me right now, some I've memorized, right? Because of the fact that they didn't know thousands of miles away what they were doing. But Brian Wilson wasn't doing that well, but he still could play his keys. It was Van Dyke Parks. His name is Van Dyke Parks, who wrote the lyrics. People didn't understand it, but it fits more to a T. Because it tells exactly... Everybody was Auld Lang Syne. The laughs come hard from that song in Auld Lang Syne, right? Surfs up aboard a tidal wave. The sailors were at the taverns along the Passaic as that little white carriage came into the cemetery. That's an amazing, from the, that, their, their album, okay, is Surfs Up. The title and the song fits more to a T. Now, she had a glass dome that, yes. that, was, that yes, protected was the, uh, oh, the statue. Yes. Uh, Mike, let's call it similar to an, uh, a glass dome for an anniversary clock. Uh -huh. uh, it was broken. Albert Cortland Munn dies, 1905, cannot restore it. Okay, so she's over the many years, right, just withering away, but she's still there. So Weird New Jersey did the latest story on her only about a year or two year ago, the two marks. And why the fascination with her? What, what brings people together wanting to know more? Uh, because she was so brilliant as a dancer. And when you read about her, even though it's not that much extant, uh, she would have been our Isadora Duncan. Remember, Isadora Duncan sure did. comes as the modern dance amazement person. Maud was very gifted. So she's on her uh, little uh, trunk of the tree looking at us dressed in her ballet outfit and the ballet slippers and all that. And she's hauntingly looking at not only the river, but at us, if at you us. look at her. Yeah, right. you can see that, you can you feel, feel it. You that, that spirit, that that uh, Is there, that the closeness. communication. If you go there in January when she died, there's blue light coming from the Pacific River at about the time they interred her at 4.01 p.m. on that January 1st. Now, there are other people, famous people, buried. Who are so many other people we'll find that in the cemetery? Well, there's an amazing house of mausoleum. Could have had up to 40, 50 people inside for John Dryden. That mausoleum is so big, it stretches a quarter of a city block long. That's a big mausoleum. Very big. Tell it's, us about John Dryden. Who was he in? John Dryden came down from uh, New England with pennies in his pocket, found it prudential. And by the time he dies around 1911, he's become a U.S. senator. His company is thriving, so much so that upon his death, J.P. Morgan marches in line to the mausoleum when it's opened up with his body. Well, and who are so many other famous people find there? Well, you'd find Ballantines there, for instance. You'd Ballantine find, Beer, the, yeah, yeah, the Beer yeah, Baron. The Beer Barons. You'll find also uh, the Freelinghuisens. We have a Freelinghuisen uh, Avenue, but now Rodney Freelinghuisen represents Morris County. He's from the old Newark line. Anyone uh, that was somebody, and there were some very famous names, look at Mrs. Edison, who died, sadly, of morphine poisoning. Uh, what happens is her husband ran home Try to electrify her. I heard of it, yes. Yes, so guess what he does? What when he puts he do? her into the ground near Maud, he puts a line down trying to talk to her. I love it. That's the ultimate long distance call. Yes, right? <laughs> he built a bench there and would stay hour after hour. When he goes and builds his factory West Orange, he marries again. But there's yes. no communication because he builds his bed into his workroom and hardly goes home to Llewellyn Park. Very rarely does he. But that young woman that he met in the rain, she came out of the rain, only 16 years of age. There's a place called Edison Place down there. He used to have his factory there for a few years. He wanted her to be a helper and a life partner. So he asked the parents, they said, oh, she's got to finish school and all that. But then she came, Mary Stilwell, beautiful face in the brilliant work. There's only one master book by the late great John Cunningham of Afton Press. He was the master blaster historian of all of New Jersey. In his book on Newark, 
Okay, you see her face there with the beautiful black ringlets coming down. What a beautiful face of Mary Stillwell. But she was very still indeed when she dies only in her late 20s and he's so in love with her, he builds a place where he can sit down, right? And then he tries to have the men of the cemetery make the line down to the coffin if she might speak. She Almost like speak. Harry Houdini wanted to speak well, to his yes, mother. Well, yes, of course, Harry Houdini. Do you have a, a favorite place in Newark that you love? Or do you it would be number one with you? There are so many favorites as a top five list, I'd say, but I have to put Mount Pleasant way up there. In fact, they were nice enough to me. Elizabeth Del Tufo, Liz Del Tufo, sure, we've had head of the Newark Preservation Landmarks, has kindly, along with Scott Wheelman, given me a little space. There was a gentleman who left behind a Celtic cross, maybe 12 feet tall, but never laid anyone to rest there of himself or his family. So I have a little space there for my ashes. So oh. I'm glad to be there. But I'm also knowing or learning that sadly I'll never know just a little bit. But that's why I want to tell you about Stone Voices. James Mano, who's here now in Artist in Residence at Columbia Maplewood, made Stone Voices. In Stone Voices, Maud comes alive. Oh, we have to try to get that. Um, it's fascinating. You, I know you love Newark. You, you've been there all your life, right? Well, uh, no, actually, I went out 26 years to Morris County. That's why I wear this. This is my uh -huh. son's jersey for the West Orange Young Devils. And that's why I was trying as Usher, usher my son in yeah. to the back door because I love this team. They came not only to New Jersey, but then they came to Newark. Well, I'll tell you, it's fascinating. Your, your knowledge is just unbelievable. The unofficial, ladies and gentlemen, the unofficial of mayor of Newark, New Jersey. Well, Mike, can I thank my father and mother, teachers. Absolutely. They brought me to curiosity and to what I am today. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, and uh, your stories are unbelievable. Your knowledge is unbelievable. Mike, I hope everybody will go out and do some detective work and enjoy because there's a lot to find out. And I'll boost again that magazine, Weird New Jersey, sold That's a great twi magazine. twice a year because the stories in it are fantastic. Great. Well, thanks so much. And this is Mike Sobel saying good night to you, you, and especially to you. Thank you.